If you wanted points, he could get you those. If you wanted assists, he could dish those. If you wanted defense, he could make life difficult for an opposing player. And if you wanted clutch big game performances, that's where he was most comfortable. But whether you got some of this or all of this, you would also likely be shaking your head in frustration a few times during the performance. Steven Jackson can fill it up quick, made evident by his eight straight seasons averaging over 15 points. But as Jackson would say himself, he was a rhythm shooter and needed ample minutes and shot opportunities to get in the groove and be effective. So if he couldn't get in rhythm, then you might be in for a frustrating night from him. But if you caught Jax on a night where he was on, you were in trouble. And there was integrity to his game, as he took his defensive responsibilities seriously. So even if he was having an off night offensively, you could still get solid contributions on the defensive end. Jackson was never an all-star, and he never started and ended the year on the same team for more than two consecutive seasons. He was labeled as someone with bad character, and although he made some poor decisions throughout his career, it was more so strong emotions and an incomparable passion for the game that guided him throughout his career. And even though you didn't always agree with it, he was being 100% authentic. And this passion and talent made him one of the most versatile and serviceable journeymen of his era, and one that was highly respected by the majority of players and staff who he crossed paths with. So today, we're going to look back on the career of a man who took an unlikely path to NBA success in Steven Jackson. Steven Jackson attended Abraham Lincoln High School in Port Arthur, Texas, where he would win a state championship as a junior. Sadly, around the same time, Jackson's half-brother passed away after injuries sustained from being jumped. This incident left all the responsibility on Jackson to be the man of the house, as his abusive stepfather was already serving time in prison. Due to academic ineligibility, Jackson would transfer to Oak Hill Academy, and even though Oak Hill is known for their ability to produce NBA talent, Jackson transferred just as much to improve his academics and graduate as he did to improve his game. Jackson's senior year saw him average about 17 points and 6.5 rebounds per game, as he was voted a 1996 McDonald's All-American, joining future NBA stars such as Mike Bibby, Rip Hamilton, Jermaine O'Neal, and Kobe Bryant. Jackson would show his ability, as he would be tied with Winfred Walton for leading scorer in the game, as he finished with 21 points. Additionally, Jackson had committed to Arizona during the season, as him and Mike Bibby were slated to join future NBAers like Jason Terry and Michael Dickerson on the Wildcats. However, even though Jackson had graduated Oak Hill, his low ACT and SAT scores made him academically ineligible to play for Arizona. Jackson would attend Butler County Community College for a semester, but wouldn't even play basketball while there. Jackson's basketball dreams were quickly dissolving, but luckily, Virginia Bibby, the mother of Mike Bibby, brought him to the Phoenix Suns tryouts prior to the 97 NBA draft, where Jackson held his own and then some, as on ESPN's The Jump, Jackson would say that he served up Cedric Sabalos during these tryouts. Jackson's performance paid off, as according to him, Brian Colangelo and Danny Ainge told him that they would pick him with their single draft pick in the 97 draft. And they did, as Jackson was selected in the second round, 43rd overall. And although he was cut by the Suns on October 30th, they still had guaranteed him $250,000, which allowed him to continue pursuing basketball in other leagues before making his way back to the NBA. And even though he was cut, Jackson would later report that he didn't have the discipline or the focus to be in the NBA at such a young age when the Suns drafted him anyway. So, for the next three seasons, Jackson found himself bouncing around leagues, as he had multiple stints in the Continental Basketball Association and would also play in the Dominican Republic, Venezuela, and Australia's NBL, while also trying out for NBA teams. Jackson's journey eventually found him back in the NBA as he signed with the Nets to begin the 01 season and now his rookie year would be four seasons after he was drafted. Jackson's chances of staying in the NBA were still quite low, as he was just signed as roster filler initially. But injuries to Kendall Gill and Keith Van Horn allowed him to see action in 77 games and start 40 of them. However, the Nets struggled and finished the season 26-56 and 56 and missed the playoffs. But Jackson made the most of his opportunity, as he averaged about 8 points, 2.5 rebounds, 2 assists, and a steal per game, while also shooting over 33% from 3. Even with this surprising rookie year, Jackson was released after the season, and he felt that his close relationship with guard Stefan Marbury contributed to this as the Nets were also looking to get rid of Marbury and trade him to the Suns in the offseason. But now, Jackson had something to show for what he could do in the NBA, and Greg Popovich and the Spurs liked enough of what they saw to sign Jackson going into the 2002 season. But this season was tough for Jackson, as he was hampered by injuries and learning the Spurs system and only played 23 games. For a 58-24 Spurs team, he would lose to the Lakers in the second round, in a playoffs that Jackson would miss. And in Jackson's shortened season, he averaged about 4 points, 1 rebound, and half an assist per game. 
2003 would be Jackson's coming out party, as a healthy Jackson played 80 games, starting 58 of them, for a Spurs team led by Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, and their franchise legend David Robinson, who was playing his final season, as well as a rookie Manu Ginobili coming off the bench. Jackson was a great two-way player this season, as on top of being third on the team in scoring behind Duncan and Parker, he was first in steals per game as well. But the playoffs is where Jackson would make his mark. The Spurs beat the Suns in round one as Jackson averaged over 16 points in this series. Round two versus the Lakers saw Jackson's contributions take a big hit as he averaged just eight per game. But then in the Western Conference Finals versus Dallas, Jackson again averaged over 16 points while shooting nearly 50% from the field and 34% from three. This series included Jackson leading all scorers with 24 points and going five of seven from three in a series clinching game six win. One of the first times Jackson would show he is not afraid of the big moment. The finals pitted Jackson against his old team, as the Spurs beat the Nets in six games. Jackson didn't quite have his Western Conference Finals performance, but he still put up over 10 points per game, including an 18-point Game 3 where he made some big shots down the stretch. So, after just three years in the league, Jackson was a champion and had played a crucial role on this title run. And for the regular season, Jackson averaged about 12 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. He would also shoot a career-high 43.5% from the field. According to an 03 New York Times article, Popovich said that the Spurs were going to offer Jackson a healthy long-term extension. And they did offer him an extension, but it wasn't as healthy as Jackson was expecting. So he turned it down and tested the market. Jackson really wanted to sign with Indiana, but the Pacers didn't have the cap space to sign him this offseason. And it was looking like Jackson made a mistake in turning down the Spurs' offer, as he ended up betting on himself and signing a one-year, $1.1 million deal with Atlanta going into the 04 season. Atlanta was coming off a disappointing 35-47 and 47 season after rolling out a trio of Sharif Abdur-Rahim, Glenn Robinson, and Jason Terry. But the Hawks traded Robinson to Philly, and Jackson took his place. And although the Hawks were bad, finishing 28-54, and 54, Jackson had his best season as a pro up to that point, as he would finish second on the team in scoring, and scored a then-career-high 42 points against the Wizards on March 12th. He would also have a career-high 6 steals versus Philly on April 6th. Abdur Rahim would also be included in a trade for Rasheed Wallace mid-season, but Wallace would only play a single game for the Hawks, which was a loss to the Nets where Jackson scored a game-high 25. For the regular season, Jackson averaged about 18 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 3 assists, while also leading the team with 1.8 steals per game. Jackson's gamble would pay off, as in the offseason he would end up where he wanted to be all along as a sign-in trade landed him in Indiana with a new 6-year, $38 million contract. Going into the 05 season, Jackson joined an already stacked Pacers team with guys like Jermaine O'Neal, Ron Artest, and Reggie Miller. The Pacers were coming off a 61-21 season that ended in a loss to the Pistons in the Eastern Conference Finals, but the addition of Jackson seemed like the missing piece. And that's exactly how it looked, as the Pacers started the year 6-2 and, and were cruising to their 7th win on a November 19th game versus Detroit in Detroit. But then, the malice at the Palace occurred, with under a minute left in a Pacers blowout. And as Jackson explained it on the Rich Eisen show, he was new and unaware of how serious the rivalry between the two teams was. So, late game, Ron Artest decided to foul Ben Wallace hard to get him back for a foul from the previous year's playoffs. Wallace retaliated by pushing Artest hard, and tempers flared. But things were starting to calm down, as Artest was laying on the scorer's table. But then, he was hit by a drink thrown by a fan and went straight into the stands, where pandemonium ensued. But look who's right behind him going into the stands. Yep, Jackson would say that he sees his NBA teammates as his family, as he spends more time with them than his own family. So when Artest started fighting, he had his back without hesitation. And Jackson would do some damage in the stands before getting pulled out and the team finally getting to the locker room. For his role in the brawl, Jackson was suspended 30 games without pay. Additionally, O'Neal was suspended 15 games, and Artest was suspended for the remainder of the season and playoffs. So the Pacers' season trajectory was now completely changed. They were still a good team, but the games missed by Jackson and O'Neal affected their overall record, and they finished just 44-38. and They would beat the Celtics in Round 1, where Jackson would lead the Pacers with almost 19 points per game. But they would lose to the Pistons in Round 2, in a series where Jackson shot under 33% from the field and under 19% from 3. But even without our test and poor shooting performances from O'Neal and Jackson, the Pacers still pushed the series to six games. And for the regular season, Jackson averaged about 18.5 points, five rebounds, and two and a half assists per game. Pacers legend Reggie Miller retired after the 05 season, 
Artes was reinstated, but after 16 games, he would demand a trade, which affected team chemistry and blindsided some of the Pacers players. Artes would not play for the Pacers again after his trade request, and would eventually be sent to the Kings for Peja Stojakovic on January 24th. The 06 season also saw O'Neal struggle with injury, as he played in just 51 games, making Jackson the only consistent member of the starting lineup, and Jackson would finish third on the team in scoring. But his efficiency suffered, as he shot about 41% from the field, as the Pacers finished 41-41. and 41. But he would average over 20 points per game in the month of April, while the Pacers made a successful playoff push, and would face and lose to the Nets in the first round, where Jackson's shooting woes would continue. But for the regular season, Jackson averaged about 16.5 points, 4 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Prior to the 07 season, Jackson and some Pacers teammates were involved in an altercation at an Indianapolis nightclub, which ended up in Jackson reportedly firing off 5 shots in the air after being hit by a car. Jackson would plead guilty to a charge of criminal recklessness, and would eventually serve a 7 game suspension at the beginning of the following season. But for the 2007 season, Jackson was on the Pacers to start the year, but after 37 games and his lowest scoring average since 2003, he was traded to the Golden State Warriors on January 17th, along with Al Harrington, as the Pacers received Troy Murphy and Mike Dunleavy in return. Jackson being shipped away was likely in large part due to the poor character reputation he was developing after the brawl and the criminal charges. But this move ended up being the best thing for Jackson and the Warriors, as Jackson and Harrington would join Baron Davis, Jason Richardson, and Monte Ellis to create a very balanced scoring attack that helped the Warriors go 23-19 and, and finish 42-40 and to make the playoffs as an 8 seed, where they would take on the 67-15 and defending Western Conference champ Dallas Mavericks. And as most people know, the We Believe Warriors, as they would come to be known, stunned the Mavericks by defeating them in 6 games, with 3 out of their 4 wins being by 12 or more points. Jackson fit well in Don Nelson's run-and-gun offense as a transition scorer and three-point shooter, while also playing good defense. Jackson would average almost 23 points per game in this series, including his playoff career high of 33 in the series clinching Game 6, but he would also get himself ejected from Games 2 and 5. Unfortunately, the Cinderella season would end in Round 2 versus the Jazz, and Jackson would not have the same impact as he did in Round 1, as Andre Karolinko and Matt Harpring held him to about 16.5 points, on less than 28% from the field, and less than 22% from three. But Jackson had quickly become a fan favorite, and was deemed the team's leader according to Baron Davis. And for the regular season overall, Jackson put up about 15.5 points, three rebounds, and four assists per game. The 2008 season returned mostly the same team, however one key piece was missing, as Jason Richardson had been traded to the Bobcats for the draft rights to Brandon Wright. Jackson would be named team captain prior to the start of the season, and even without Richardson, Davis, Jackson, and Ellis would make up a scoring trio that averaged about 62 points per game. However, Jackson struggled to remain efficient as he shot under 41% from the field. The Warriors played well and improved on their record of last year, but unfortunately 48-34 and wouldn't be enough to make the playoffs in an incredibly competitive Western Conference where the 8-seeded Nuggets were still a 50-win team. The Warriors' 48 wins is the highest win total from a team that didn't make the playoffs. And for the regular season, Jackson would average about 20 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. The 2009 season continued to see change in Golden State, as Baron Davis had signed with the Clippers in the offseason. Then, on November 21st, one of Jackson's good friends on the team was traded, when Al Harrington was sent to New York for Jamal Crawford. And just days before this, Jackson had signed a 3-year extension with the Warriors. Jamal Crawford fit Don Nelson's run-and-gun system well. However, Monte Ellis would play just 25 games this year, while Jackson would elect to have surgery on a lingering turf toe injury on March 31st, which would shut him down for the rest of the season. Jackson, Crawford, and Ellis still put up a lot of points as they averaged nearly 60 points combined when they were playing, but the Warriors would end the year with a 29-53 record and miss the playoffs. Jackson would have a career year in the 59 games he played, as he averaged a career high in points and assists with 20.7 points, 5.1 rebounds, and 6.5 assists per game. Jackson would also pick up 18 technicals this year in just 59 games. Jackson played in the first 9 games of the 2010 season with the Warriors, but was traded to the Bobcats on November 16th and went on to have one of his best seasons as a pro. He ended up averaging 21.1 points per game in 72 games for Charlotte, which would have been a career high for a season, but his 9 games in Golden State averaging 16.6 points dropped his overall average to 20.6 points. 
Jackson and Gerald Wallace would help the Bobcats to the best scoring defense in the league, which led to a 44-38 record and the franchise's first playoff appearance. Jackson had some big moments this season as well, such as going for a franchise record and career-high 43 points versus the Rockets on January 12th. The Bobcats would face the defending Eastern Conference champion Orlando Magic in the first round, and although they got swept, they only lost one game by double digits. Jackson shot below 36% for the series, but did lead the team in scoring at 18 points per game, including 27 points in Game 2. And for the regular season, Jackson would average about 20.5 points, 5 rebounds, and 3.5 and assists per game. 2011 would be Jackson's last season that would see him as a full-time starter. Jackson recorded the first triple-double in Bobcats franchise history in a November 20th win versus Phoenix. The league was also cracking down on player behavior and reportedly sent a video to all teams which demonstrated behavior that would be grounds for a technical foul. And Jackson's actions were used a lot in this video. Nonetheless, Jackson kept racking up technical fouls as he had 16 this season. And after playing 48 games for the Bobcats, Gerald Wallace would be traded to the Blazers on February 24th for players and picks. A trade that Jackson reportedly wasn't too happy about. Jackson would go on to play 67 games for the Bobcats, again leading the team in scoring. But the Bobcats didn't have a lot of talent, and Jackson himself shot about 41%, as the team finished 34-48 and 48 and missed the playoffs. And for the regular season, Jackson averaged about 18.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 3.5 and assists per game. Jackson would be traded to Milwaukee in the 2011 offseason as part of a three-team deal involving the Bucks, Bobcats, and Kings. Jackson's time in Milwaukee was short-lived, as he struggled with a hamstring injury that had been lingering throughout the lockout, but he also butted heads with head coach Scott Skiles throughout his time there, and it didn't help that Jackson was putting up some of the worst numbers of his career. But on March 13th, Jackson would be traded back to the Warriors as part of the Andrew Bogut Monte Ellis trade, but before playing a game for the Warriors, he would get traded back to another former team, as the Spurs acquired him on March 15th. Jackson would play a backup role to a young Kawhi Leonard, and he played in just 21 games for a 50 and 16 Spurs team who made the Western Conference Finals before losing to a young OKC Thunder team. Jackson didn't have a huge role throughout the playoffs, but he made the most of his minutes as he was uncharacteristically efficient, shooting over 53% from the field and over 60% from three this postseason, including six three-pointers in Game 6 of the Western Conference Finals. And for the regular season, Jackson would average about 10 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. Jackson would play 55 games for the Spurs in the 2013 season, but would not finish the year with the Spurs team that finished 58-24 and and made it all the way to the NBA Finals. Jackson indirectly may have forced his way out of San Antonio when he tweeted a threat at Serge Ibaka, likely after seeing Ibaka and his former Pacers teammate get into it in a game between the Lakers and the Thunder. Additionally, Jackson and Ibaka had also had their own dust-ups in the previous year's Conference Finals. So, about a week before the playoffs, Jackson was waived, and for his 55 games on the Spurs for the season, he averaged about 6 points, 3 rebounds, and 1.5 and assists per game. Jackson would have trouble finding a new team, but would sign with the Clippers about a month and a half into the 2014 season. But he couldn't get anything going in LA, and only played in 9 games before being released less than a month after he was signed. And in these 9 games, Jackson averaged about 1.5 and points, 1 rebound, and half an assist per game, in what would be his final games in the NBA. Jackson would play a bit more basketball as he spent some time in the Big 3 League after his retirement in 2015. So in his unlikely journey to the NBA, Jackson showed that his talent alone belonged in the league all along. He was a great scorer when he was in rhythm, but you couldn't always rely on him for an efficient performance, evidenced by his career 41.4% shooting. Luckily, he wasn't just a scorer, as he had good floor vision and a passing ability. But similar to his scoring, it didn't come without a price, as he could be turnover prone. But he didn't just care about his stats on the offensive side of the ball, as he played some great defense too, and appeared to take it as seriously as his offensive game most of the time. But Jackson's biggest weaknesses were his own discipline and self-control. He wore his heart on his sleeve, which you love, as his passion for the game was evident, but he would also be near the top of the league's technical foul leaderboards consistently. He unfortunately never saw himself spend too much time with one team, as he was almost always shipped away after he had overstayed his welcome or burned bridges. This led to reputations as a bad character individual, yet the players, coaches, and executives around the league had shining reviews for him. It didn't seem to be as much of an issue of character as it was just an emotional individual that gave it all to the game. His actions could probably be considered selfish or thoughtless at times, but if Tim Duncan is calling you the ultimate teammate, you can't be that bad. 
Steven Jackson was all about respect and loyalty. If you showed those things to him, he would show them back. But if he got any indication that you weren't respecting him or those around him, then you lost him and you probably weren't going to get him back. But that's what made Captain Jack one of a kind. And that's it for today's episode. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more like this one. If you did like this video, check out this playlist for plenty more player profiles. Thanks for watching and see you next time.